Hey, this is Dr. Kevin Quishan, but you can just call me Kevin, and I am on the Best Practices Show with my brother, Kirk Barrett. Hey guys, thanks for watching the Best Practices Show. We take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all over the world. And if you're a dentist and you're on the path of growing a practice, you're trying to pick the direction you go and health center dentistry, is it totally possible in modern day times, in modern practice era? We're going to go to the expert, Dr. Kevin Quishin, in just a second. He's going to show us the ins and outs. You do not want to miss this. So do me a favor, just grab a pen and hit the share button. Sit back. You're going to love this. Now, couple show notes. We are shooting this live on Facebook right now as we speak. So if you have questions while you're watching the broadcast, add them to the feed or even a couple shout outs for Kevin because you'll already see this guy's a great guy. And uh, and uh, I'll ask him the questions while we have him on live. Also, if you get these questions or if you're watching this later on and you have questions, add them to the feed and you'll see Kevin is really good at getting back to you. And we want to make sure you get the most out of these while you're watching the show. Now, I am so grateful because even this morning, I've gotten more and more requests for shows, things that you guys want to see. We are lining them up as best we can. Uh, so keep sending them to us. And then thank you so much for all the shares. We are now up over 39,000 followers on Facebook. Over 150,000 of you have visited us on iTunes, and all I can say is thank you. So we are having a lot of fun, and we don't even really know what we're doing. We're just kind of making it up as we're going. But I, I think the key is that we just keep getting good people like you on. So I've got my good friend. Now, our guest today, Dr. Kevin Quishan. Kevin, I've known you for a long time. I watched you develop it not only from a great dentist to a great educator, and now you're doing some really cool stuff. So I know who you are. A lot of our viewers know who you are. But if somebody's watching this, a young dental student or somebody for the first time, they don't know who Dr. Kevin Quishan is. Give us a little background on who you are and what you do. Um, oh, that's a loaded question. Basically, it's like you just already said. It's I'm doing the same thing you're doing. I am just totally winging it, man. That's, uh, <laughs> that's I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> you're not totally winging it. You know what you're doing. So, um, but you're you know you started with your own practice, uh, and then you got involved in you know continuing education and became a pre a very big influencer in continuing education. And now you're um, you're still in practice. So give us a little background of what you do just on a weekly basis. Yeah. So well, on a weekly basis, right now it's sort of crazy. I transitioned out of um, Spear education in December. So, my, uh, you know, basically it was an evolution that's um, been sort of coming for years. Um, so, right now on a weekly basis, I am either in practices, uh, coaching, consulting, either with the team or with the dentist, um, working on technical stuff, helping them integrate things that they've never really integrated but wanted to, um, doing some dentistry in a couple of practices. Um, I'm online a lot, uh, well, virtually working with people, like for your show today, I was uh, with a guy in England going over some treatment planning for him, so, you know, the beauty of 2018 is you can do a lot of stuff without being uh, being there. Absolutely. So, yeah, so it's uh, every week, I, I don't really have, sort of like you, um, I don't really have a set weekly schedule, which is really great, it allows me to be flexible, so mm -hmm. it's really varied, uh, a couple study clients. Speak to a couple of study clubs, a couple of groups coming up, a couple of workshops coming up. It's um, if you looked at my schedule right now, you'd go, dude, you're, you have no flow. And honestly, it's it's okay right now. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's fun like that, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, you know, I always like to start with the why before we get into the how. We're going to be talking about the hows and the ins and outs of health center dentistry. But let's talk about what, why this is so important in this modern era of practice. So a young dentist might what be watching this, going, you know, Kevin, I like these things, but is it possible? So let's talk about the why this is so important. Yeah. Well, I mean, why, especially in 2018, as I mean, we've watched since I graduated in '95. I mean, we watch the, everybody talks about it every day and I sort of get tired of talking about it, except we have to, like, I mean, debt is a big deal. It's changing what the new dentist can and can't do. 
the healthcare system is actually messed up, um, you know, as far as the legality of it and, um, and, and just the way evolution, the way society is evolving has changed dentistry quite a bit. And so what used to be the ideal, what your sort of view, your vision of what was going to happen when you graduated is more difficult today. And um, you hear it all the time. Like, can you have a private practice? Can you do health-centered dentistry? And can you do it in the, um, in the corporate setting if that's what we have to do? So it's so relevant right now because we, we were moving so well towards health-centered dentistry and then with debt and corporate and i'm not against corporate dentistry don't mishear me but but with that sort of pendulum swing that way um th things started moving maybe back a little bit we regressed a little bit and now new dentists are like well i guess what i thought i wanted as a kid when i you know when i thought i wanted to go into dentistry isn't possible and so yeah it is totally possible you just have to do it with within with intention you know yeah. and it's really possible yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the opportunity too. with so much out there. There's always a lot of information. Everybody talks about this, but this is a great opportunity for a young dentist. And I think the world wants this, you know, people want to be healthy. We're already seeing it in concierge medicine. A lot of great professionals like cardiologists are saying, I'm done with this disease model and mm -hmm. I'm going to start doing it the way I need to do it in order to be able to proactively take care of these patients. So it's mm -hmm. a huge opportunity. Now, one mm -hmm. of the things I just found out this about you, you have a master's in healthcare management. That's that's kind of very well. Actually, it's not kind of. It's super cool. It's how cool. the heck? How the heck did you get that in? <laughs> did, you know, being a dentist. I mean, do you just love going to school? Or what? Yeah, what's yeah, the deal? It's, been. it's yeah. funny. It was the same. It's um. I, it's you know how letters make a difference to a lot right. of people. They, they really don't to me mostly, but they do a little bit. Um, like it. They, I, in my master's program took me two and a half years to get through. I did it when I was um, the director of the faculty practice at Oregon Health Science University. So I was running that practice and teaching and then doing my master's degree at the same time. It was spectacular. Mm -hmm. um, but it took me two and a half years to do it. Whereas if I would have gone through as a cohort, like a two year, take the same classes with the same people for two years, that would have been an MBA in healthcare. But if you don't go through it as a cohort and you sort of do it on your own time, so it took me six more months, it's a master's degree. Right. And I say that because I'm like, you know, like, it, like we all did the same um, capstone. We, we all took all the same courses, except the people that did it as a cohort actually have MBA after their name. Mm -hmm. Mine is MS. And, I, and I'm thinking, you know, like, I don't know why, but I, I, I think I'd rather have the MBA because there's a lot of dentists that an MS means prosthodontics. Mm -hmm. Whereas an MBA is like, no, I know my stuff in healthcare, in the business world. And, um, but, but anyway, so I did that. Um, when did I finish that? In 2012, I guess, maybe 13, 13. So I was doing all I was running the faculty practice and it was, I got to tell you, if I could have quit everything and just been in that educational process for the rest of my life, because it was pre, um, it was right as, and I don't want to get political on your show, but it was. You look at you. You're like, oh, you can totally. <laughs> I had Howard for in and he's like, can I offend everybody? I'm like, well, my grandma oh, watches his show. Oh, <laughs> so, I was, I was on a show. It was crazy. But anyway, um, but it was right as we were um, yeah. integrating the um, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. And so as I'm going through learning, I'm learning from people that are so forward thinking and the and the energy around healthcare. When I was doing my degree was amazing because I was learning from the people that were, were in the trenches doing it. Oh my God, I just, I walked out of class or got done reading what I was supposed to read or, and I was so jazzed about the hope for healthcare and being in it. And so I, anyway, I don't think there could have been a better time for me to go through and do that degree because I, I just, I learned so much about healthcare in general. And then, um, yeah, it was just spectacular. Yeah, I you loved probably, it. You probably still use it every day as it is, right? Oh, every day. Like there were courses like, you know, we all talk about it, and you do too. We talk about leadership and communication and systems and, um, and management, um, uh, project management. And I had all those classes. I had, I had finance, healthcare finance, health communication, healthcare, leadership and healthcare, project management and healthcare, 
I mean, it was, so it, that's why I just ate it up. I just loved it. Anyway, you feel my energy right now. Like I, I dug it totally. I dug love it. it. I yeah. love it. I love it. Now I think it would, it, yeah. Now you're, and you actually, I mean, you, how do, I have so many questions for you. You, you, you gotten a chance to hang out with some pretty cool people. I mean, in, in your journey. And now even today you practice in, uh, Leanne Brady's practice on a part-time basis, which that's like, it's like one of the best jobs in probably all of dentistry, right? <laughs> well, we've known for a long time. So. I know we could. She's so classy. And you get a chance to see this. Let's start with a definition of health center dentistry because somebody might be watching this and going, I think I kind of know what that is, but how would you see it? And let's, let's talk, let's start there. Yeah. Well, you know, that's funny because I'll bet our definition might be different. Um, health center dentistry for me is literally intentionally helping a patient see what optimal health is and moving towards that in a manner that is appropriate for each patient. Mm -hmm. So notice what I said, the practice is not um, team-centered, now we'll come back to that in a little bit, but, but healthcare, health-centered dentistry is helping the patient see what optimal health is, understand what optimal health is, have hope that they can achieve optimal health, and then take appropriate steps for them and it might take a year, it might take three years, it might take five years, but it's knowing what optimal health is. And the problem in dentistry is, you know, as you know, even new graduates, no offense, because I, I taught in the dental school and I still love it, but we don't really have an understanding, a deep understanding of what an optimal stomatic nathic system is and what that looks like. So if we don't know it, how in the hell can we help our patients move, see it and move towards it? Does that make right. sense? Makes perfect sense. Ma makes yeah. perfect sense. It's the, you know, you could say it's the cliche, it's the old end in mind, but it's actually a picture. And um, this is so important now more than ever, because what we're talking about is helping patients. Patients are going to be living longer than ever. Do okay. you know what I mean? So the chances of this dentistry failing, you know, you need the whole support system in order for it to work long term anyway. And I'm guessing when you're talking about health center dentistry, we're also in introducing the behavioral side of it too, which nobody oh. hardly ever talks about, right? Huge, huge. Well, behavioral meaning for you, what do you mean by in integrating what type of the behavioral are you talking about there? Well, just behavioral is more of the emotional side of things. A lot of times people want to do optimal dentistry, but they don't realize like it's a big function of how well I can communicate, connect with human beings, create trust, oh. Oh. you know, help them understand. There's words like co-discovery um, <laughs> that, you know, um, everyone has their own unique definition. But basically, we learn together, we trust each other. And yeah. it's based on a mutual trust, long-term basis, not so much quick, quick hits for each each person. So, yeah. I know that's kind of a scattered thing, but um, yeah. it's important as a dentist to just chart your course. I always say this, Kevin, and as we get into this, I don't know if there's anything more important than just going to work and you do it the way you want to do it. Do you know what I mean? You go like, this is how I always dreamed I would take care of people. Would you agree? Yes. Oh well. And again, in, in your field that I, I share with you now more intentionally. By the way, do you remember that bef that little side when I because I say I share this profession with you now that when back in 2013 when mm -hmm. I was sort of I had finished my master's degree and I was thinking about going into like an associate deanship maybe or back into private practice or into coaching, I called you. We had a phone call. I think we had two phone calls. Yes. Yes. Two, okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, and that was back in 2013. Which well, I remember because I couldn't get your name right. Quick, quick, quick. quick. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a terrible last name too, so I'm like, I, I know you, you know. Yeah. And so, and then I saw you again, and I remember the conversation at the Marriott. I think yes. it was at the uh, before the Restorative Academy or something yeah. like that. I mean, so our yeah. paths have intersected a lot. I do remember that conversation, and you were on the cusp of making big decisions. Yeah, yeah. Well, then I got asked to come to Spear, so I was just like, well, put that on hold, and and now I'm back. But anyway, funny long story, but. Back to your question um, about uh, each dentist just making making it their own, um, and that's what made me think about you and your line of work and our similarities now, is that you know that there are people out there that just sort of do the same thing with every practice, and we, we call them consultants that are coaches, and yet it, it doesn't work for every dentist, right? And so one of the key things really is is helping the dentist like, I mean, deep, taking some deep dives sometimes, some painful dives, and finding out what really is important to them and how they want to bring that to the practice and then create systems around that. And then the practice thrives because you really, like you said, making it, you're, you're taking their core, core values, 
and bringing them to the practice. And it, it's not easy um, to do. And some dentists just don't even look that way. So I yeah. was on a tangent, but, but yes, it's, it's, it's helping a practice be what the dentist is instead of just being a cookie cutter dental practice. Right. Right. And, you know, people have said this forever. Um, even Howard Ferran, who's have, I love Howard. He, he's all over. He's like, look, you want to get healthy, you get a coach. If you want to, your business to be better, you get a consultant. And we, we entered, we, you know, we exchange those words. I like coaching, but there are times where you have to be a consultant. You just got to tell people what to do. And even next week, I mean, in our business, our growth, I know that I can only do so much and then it takes up all my brain space. I got to bring in experts. I've got experts coming in that are good at the next level. You just can't assume to know it all. And you don't want to. Like they've done it before. They know the ins and outs. Just do what you do. And then when it comes to getting help, just get the help from the right people. Because mm -hmm. our careers were based on this. Kevin, you had people come in your life that you're like, oh my gosh, I needed to hear you when I heard you. And it sends you on the right trajectory for you. Yeah. And now you're giving back. And it's awesome to watch you give back, speak to study clubs. And all yeah. that, and it's just, it, it makes this profession so much fun. Yeah, yeah. You just hang out with really, pretty much. I just happen to hang out with really smart people, and I get like a, a a smidge of them because I don't have so much brain space either. You know, like this week, actually going on right now, um, in Washington is uh, well. I guess I'm not promoting it because I love them so much. But is leadership and legacy. You know, Joan Undershoots has been just mm -hmm. part of my core for a lot of my life, and Mary Osborne. Um, and it really is just hanging around people like that. And then there's other people. Um, one of my mentors forever, from when I went to Panky way back in the day, Margie Mannering is a, is a yeah, dentist yeah. in Chicago. You know Margie? Yeah, absolutely. And she just, she is my guiding light. Like you would never assume that somebody like Margie, I mean, I would assume that she is, but I mean, she's not on the lecture circuit. She's, mm -hmm. you, you know, I, I met her because she was my visiting faculty at Panky way back in the day. But I mean, she knows her technical dentistry is second to none. Her behavioral skills are second to none. Her out, her, the way she thinks. And I mean, she's, she's one of my guiding lights like forever. And yet you just got to find these really smart people and latch onto them. And even when they try and run from you, probably like a few of mine have, I, I latched onto them and uh, I sort of bit into them and wouldn't let go for a while, you know? Yeah. And I think that's the key too, is that you, you, you just said the magic because a lot of you that just say, I need to find a mentor. Well, mentors don't find you, you find them. Yeah. And then yeah. you hang on and you're like, okay, you're going to teach me. You're going to help me. I need you to help me. And then you've got to be the proactive piece because most of the times a mentor has a pretty bu busy life, busy practice, and they're busy educators. If that's the direction you go, but let's, let's go back. I want to really, talk about the health center dentistry and then kind of the steps and how you see it. Cause you get to see practices all over the country. If I'm going to truly build a health center practice in modern practice, what do I need to know about that journey ahead of me? Well, you, yeah, a couple of good things. One is you need to know, um, you need to have a deep understanding of dentistry and I, and you know, deeper than like we already said when they, when you left dental school and uh, that means having a understanding of the stomatic nathic system and, how it's connected and and and, and like it's, it's not just an inch deep it's it's pretty it's it's pretty many miles deep but it's also many miles wide and it's gathering this information so that you feel comfortable mm -hmm. talking about it with your patients but um and so understanding what an optimal system is is a big deal but then it really is and it sounds so simple but sadly it's not um is, is your team. It really is all about having the support system that you need in your office with your team. And for a lot of people, that means, because how do you bring health center dentistry to it? It's you get to practice on your team. And I mean, practice, like you practice your comprehensive exam on your team. You practice taking photos on your team. You practice making bite splints on your team. By the time they're done with that, they felt optimal. Even if, even if, all the, the only time they felt it was on an appliance, but they got to feel, you know, a solid bite and, and knowing that the muscles and joints are working great. Now they're like, wow, that's what it is. They've experienced it now and, and they've experienced the exam and they understand how important the photos are. And just that, if that's all you did, you know, with your team, you'd, you'd, you'd start moving towards health center dentistry because now you have people that get it. Yeah. And, and so often they don't, they'll go to wherever and learn 
dentistry, but then they come back and the team doesn't know how to support them because they've never experienced it. Right, right. And we see it all the time. No, I absolutely. And you nail it on the head. Like I always tell dentists, if you were going to walk into a room and it would be all dental students and you only give them one tip for a successful career in dentistry, you only get one sentence. That's it. And then you got to walk out. You know, what would it be? And everyone's like, okay, just surround yourself with great people and take good care of them you know, and then you'll be okay. And so, but it's easy to say hard to do. There are a lot of times you get confused. You get a lot of information. You as a dentist go back and go, ah, and they go, what did he just say? And then, then the team goes, just, just let him calm down. He'll be, he'll be back to normal by Wednesday or whatever. (laughs) And the pattern continues. But if you really get this now, I would imagine with healthcare center, dentistry or health center dentistry, you're going to have to find people with the right core values though, right? You, these people just don't come into your office off of indeed or dentalpost.net and say, Hey, Dr. Creation, I want a job here. And you're like, Oh my gosh, that was so easy. Right? Yeah. And the, just like, just like the stomatic nathic system, it's all connected, right? You, you, you have to find the right people. Well, how do you find the right people? Well, that means you have to have some, some good skills to, if you want to use the word interview, so that you you find the right people, and then you intentionally, for again, for lack of a better word, onboard with some intention to help grow them. But finding the right people is a big deal because, as you well know, you, you find the right people, and you can teach them anything. Right. It really is is finding people that that you see the fire in them, just like you, that seem like good, genuine people that maybe have a history of of something that helped them move towards health. But the interview process. And and that initial that initial onboarding um, is critical, and, and then and then you're flying. You know? Yeah, I think onboarding is a key word. Like some people say onboarding, but it really becomes waterboarding. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> they just take so much, and then the dentist says go, and the the team yeah. members like go where? And yeah. then before you know it, you're you're working a hundred miles an hour. But it is key that you have some type of a process in bringing these. Now, you often use the word like team-centered systems. Explain that. Once you get this in place, you you know, you have a good understanding of the, the entire system, then you find the right people. You're you're a big fan of team-centered systems. I am, I am. And and the history I'll give I'll give you the brief sort of history where that comes from is, you know, back when I guess when I started in the early 90s and even when I was running the lab in the 80s, it really was a lot of dentist offices were were dentist focused, and especially in the 70s and 60s. It was, I mean, that was the culture of the United States. It was, I have a DMD after my name. You're my patient. I, you have a broken tooth. You need a crown. Go out and schedule with Cindy, and then I'll see you next week. And the patient said, okay. And that was it. And all the systems in the office, which you didn't really need many because it was they were all focused around the dentist. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and then sometimes we could we could mesh that a little bit and say, oh, it's about the business, because without the business, we won't we do. None of us would have a job. So everything we do, it's about keeping the business going. And that felt good, you know, until the 80s or so. And then in the 80s, it really became about patient-centered practice. You know that really well. And then when we were starting to develop like our, our why in the practice or why we do this on Mondays and why we, why we do the things we do, it was because we wanted the patient to have a great experience. Mm-hmm. And that felt really, really great for the team members. We're like, yeah, we're doing it for the team. I mean, we're doing, it, we're doing it for the patient. Everything's about the patient. Best experience. We want them to have the best experience ever. And it felt great. And that was evolution, I think, of the United States and the world. And then as we've evolved, you know, you think, well, the team was like, everything's about the patient, but we're right here. Mm-hmm. And honestly, it was in the 90s, um, Peter Senge, you know, Peter Senge, Fifth Discipline. Fifth Discipline, yeah. I mean, the dude's just brilliant, right? And Otto Scharmer from Germany. These guys were, you know, MIT, USC, you know, forward thinkers. And they said, no. If we develop systems around the team, it really was team centered. Mm -hmm. So now when we talk about what we're doing in the practice, it's everything we do is based on what you need to do your job to the best of your ability. And and I come in every day and Outward Mindset is a great book by the Arbinger Institute that I've just been promoting the hell out of for because because it says it so cleanly and clearly. Right. It's just it's perfect. But. Basically, it's, you know, I walk in every day and I say, Kirk, what do you need to do 
today for you to do your job to the best of your ability. Now, I, I, know I have my own needs and challenges and objectives, but I want to know what you need today. And then I look at Cindy over here and say, what do you need? And then I look at Christy over here and say, what do you need? And Rebecca over here and, and Michelle over here. But then they also walk in and they look at me and say, oh, Kevin, what do you need to do your job to the best of your ability? And they look at everybody else. So when we start creating, and again, if you come up with a better word, I'll pay you for it, um, better word than systems in the office. I still haven't come up with it. But when we're developing systems or flow in the office, that's the only other word, it really is, it's not about the patient. It's about, okay, here's we need to go from here to here. Now let's all see the steps that take and, and who does it hit and am I doing what you need? Am I giving you what you need to do your job to the best of your ability? So we're creating systems in the office that are really totally focused on the team, making sure that everybody, that I support everybody to do their job to the best of their ability. And they do the same for every system. And then in the end, guess who gets, guess who has a spectacular experience in the office? It's a patient. Mm -hmm. It's a patient. But yet, but yet the team every day is like, yes, but we're here to support each other. And we're doing that intentionally, and it feels amazing. And the patients, you know, and I've seen it, I experienced it. The patients walk in, and they say, there is just something different about this office. Like, I don't know what they go home and they tell their spouse. There's something different about, the, about that office. Mm -hmm. And what it is is they felt, and I, I'll, I'm happy to use the word, as you know, they felt genuine love in the practice. They felt this deep support. They couldn't put words to it. Mm -hmm. But that's what they felt in the office because it was a team that everybody has everybody's back and all the systems are built around each other. And, and in the end, it, it works better that way. So that was a long diatribe. That was a long answer. But that's that's team centered. Yeah. And it's it, I mean, you and I are on the same page as this. It, it, you know, dentists in the end, they need high levels of predictability. When you're determining a, a direction that you want to practice, you've got to create a predictable way of doing it on a daily basis. It doesn't require a lot of brain space. It's beneficial for the team, the experience of the patient, no different than a pilot flying a plane, doing the best job, or a, a server working in a restaurant. If they're working in a high-end restaurant, they need to know that all the system's in back so that I can deliver on my promises. So ultimately, I love where you're going with this, and that's one of the biggest gaps is creating a predictable way to operate every day and to to improve it. Because when you find gaps in them, you can often improve the system and it inc yeah. includes the experience. Now, another thing that you're, I, I love a lot of your thinking, you're not a big fan of the case presentation work. Like even though we use it, yeah. can you yeah. explain in health center dentistry, explain, explain your process or thought process around that? Well, again, a case pre you know, again, there it's verbiage is important, right? And so a presentation is, you know, by the word is ah, presentation. You know, I've I've got this all set up and now it's time to present it. Mm -hmm. And historically in dentistry, as you know, it's it's okay, the patient's coming back and I've got to have the treatment plan ready. This is the case presentation. Right. And I and if they say no to this, I gotta be ready for that. So what if they say no to that? And if I if they say no to that, and so you got four treatment plans ready to go. And it's like you're guessing everything they might say, and, and you got to be ready for that. And so here's the presentation for today. And there's a lot of anxiety around it those days. Um, and, and then do they say yes or do they say no? And, and if they say no, then all of them, we suck today, and, and I suck as a dentist, and um, now we don't get to do the dentistry, now I'm going to go broke. And you just go down that path, right? So for, <laughs> it's not that bad for everybody, but... But that's what case presentation really is. It's like this huge deal. Whereas if you're, and you said earlier, the co-diagnosis, you know, Bob, Bob Barkley, you know, coined that term. And, and co-diagnosis and co-discovery is really about, again, helping them see where they are, helping them see what's possible, and then deciding what is the appropriate step to start moving towards health. So if we start that, Early and leverage is a big word I use, right? Like if we start that from the time they call and that's our environment all the way through, we have systems set up to support that. When it comes time to talk about treatment, really the question is, well, what makes sense to help us move towards health for mm -hmm. you? And, and let's figure that out together because they've already seen health. They know what's possible. They see the value. We've helped them see that it's, that there's hope to move in that direction. And then What's appropriate for you? So the conversation on, as opposed to case presentation is, well, 
we've sort of looked at everything. Sounds like you got it. What what makes sense to you? Mm-hmm. And then and then having a conversation. But again, if the dentist doesn't know what optimal is, and and no understand dentistry, then that conversation is really uncomfortable um, because they don't have the confidence to get the patient there. Yeah. But when you do have that that depth and breadth of dental knowledge, and then you use the co-discovery, co-diagnosis process, case presentation really is a, sounds to me like what's appropriate for you is this. And the patient's like, yeah, I get like, yeah, totally, I guess so. That's sort of what it looks like. And like, sweet. You know, mm-hmm. let's, and it just, it, it's not such a big presentation, but it takes having, again, systems in place all the way to that process so that it isn't so overwhelming or stressful or, oh my God, I have to be ready for everything they're going to say. You figure it out together. It's, it's co-discovery. Yeah. And you've been training young dentists for a long time. You got a chance to see, I mean, you, you've had dentists come to you that are just fresh out of practice and they're excited about this. And what, and I get these questions too, Kevin, like, let's say I'm a 32 year old dentist. I'm watching this. I go, Kevin makes sense. But like, I got 5,000 patients, all PPO, like war, you know, you get them too. So what would you say to that? Like, yeah. and, and a career ahead of you as a dentist? Yeah. Yeah. And so you got, you, you might be in corporate dentistry. You might be in, you know, whatever it is where you're like, I don't have time for that. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, you can still start doing things with intention. I promise you, Kirk, that the majority of of dentists out there that are in that environment where to pay off their debt and their bills and to support their family, they're just trying to do the dentistry. I promise you that most of them go home and go, I can be better than this. I know there's more out there. And so can you do that in corporate dentistry or in the FAST model? You know what? You can. You can do an abbreviated version of of the comprehensive exam, if you will. You can, you can quickly evaluate the joints and the muscles and look at the bite and see how the teeth are bumping each other. You can do that in five minutes, which is a hell of a lot better than not doing, than not looking at all and saying, I don't have time. It's just the way you, it's the way you're looking at things in those 10 minutes, as opposed to the way you were looking at those things in 10 minutes. And, and it's key verbal skills or the behavioral side of it that can help patients see health with intention, right? So, so you tweak a few things, and even in those busy practices, you're, you're changing the way you're talking to dentists. You're, you, I know we still got to go, we still got to go, but yet you're helping them move towards health a little more intentionally. So I know it sounds really simple, but then in the end, it sort of is. Yeah, absolutely. Getting back to the simple. Now, you're out there, you get a chance to go into other people's practices. People that are on this path, they want to create health center dentistry and monitored practice. When you walk into an office, what's the biggest consistent challenge you see in a lot of these offices that you're like, oh, there it is again, you know, yeah. there it is again, there it is again. What is it? Uh, yeah, I'd say there's two. Um, one is, is you, is, I'm sorry, it's the team, right? And the team is that way, whatever way we want them to be, because the dentist doesn't feel confident with the leadership skills or doesn't understand, doesn't have a vision of where they want to go. We talked about that earlier. And if that's not clear to you, then you're just throwing spaghetti at a wall every day and and hoping it works because there's no foundation as to where you want to go. And then the team doesn't know what to do. So I walk in and there's just, you know, teams are, they want to be there, but they have no guidance. They have no flow. And, and the dentist is just like, yeah, and my team, you know, they don't get it. And I'm like, well, what have you done to help them get it? Mm -hmm. You know, what's your why, if you will, because if they don't know your why, then, then how, how, how can they help you? If you don't develop some systems around your why, then how can they get it? So I would say team is, is probably the biggest one. You walk in and you're like, yep, I, I know, I know. And that's okay. And you're going to be fine and you're not alone. And, and then the other is going to courses, whether they be high level or not, and then just not integrating because they don't integrate with, again, with intention. They, they, they come back and they're busy and they don't know how to take steps to integrate what they've learned. And again, there's a downward spiral because then they're moping all day. They're like, well, I'm spending money. I'm learning all this. I can't do it. And then there's this downward spiral of honestly depression and anxiety in dentists because they start feeling like, like, like they suck. But, but they're, that's because they haven't intentionally made sure they 
they don't suck, I guess. I don't know how to say that nicely. Um, well, and I think you get caught in the gap where you're going to gorgeous, you're going to courses where you can see gorgeous dentistry, beautiful dentistry, optimal, ideal. And then you go back and you're like, oh, I'm not there yet. And then you just, you constantly get frustrated by what you know could be and what is instead of saying, hey, look, let's just take these little steps and moving in that direction. But Kevin, I, have, I run into a lot of dentists that do incredible education. Do you have a system or methodology? Like if you're going to spend $6,000 on a course yeah. and it's going to be a weekend course, like what should I, shouldn't I have like a team meeting plan when I get back? <laughs> should I take notes during the course? I, and I even watch these dentists during the course. They don't take any notes too. Yeah. I'm like, wait a minute, how can you sit for three? three days and not yeah. write anything. And they just go like this. And I'm like, are you getting it all? Cause I don't even remember what the guy said five minutes ago. So, yeah. so give us some methodology or tips behind this. Yeah. Well, you sort of already said it. I mean, yeah, yes, no, it's, but honestly it's, while it's still fresh, it's what are the key points that if you could go back tomorrow and integrate and it wasn't a problem, like don't not, not the, yeah, but I can't, but if you could, the things that you have learned that if you could go back to, to back tomorrow and just do it, Write those two or three things down. I mean, yes, you've taken other notes, but grab your, man, it's these points that I got that if I could just do tomorrow, I would do. So you got it, because otherwise you have nothing, right? But then, like you said, it really is uh, team meetings. And I mean, like, you know, people are so opposed to even half-day team meetings. They're like, yeah, but that's production. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't take a half-day. And it's like, ah, you take a half-a-day once a month, and your production goes up because everybody's on the same page. And so at your monthly meeting, it's a, and say you're a hygienist, Kirk, you're, you're a hygienist and you just went and took some CE. Well, that month at our, our half day team meeting, you get a half hour to help all of us understand what you learned at that meeting. And then we can talk about integrating that. And so for me, it's very intentional team meetings, um, that are structured, um, every month that, and part of that is, what do we want to integrate and how do we create systems around it? So it's, again, it sounds so simple because it can be if you do it with intention. If you have those team meetings once a month and that's part of it, then then you get to integrate that stuff. Right. Well, teams that are serious about being good teams are serious about creating methods to communicate, which is, means you have to land the airplane to fix it. And everybody knows that even the highest producers in the United States have dedicated time to talk to the most important people, which are our team members. Now, I owe it. And the plane to fix it. Did you say you have to land the plane? To oh, fix yeah. It? That's one of my favorite analogies. You can't fix, like so many dentists are trying to fix an airplane in the air. Oh, the window's broken out. Okay. You know what I mean? Like they're fixing yeah. it while they're flying. No, great air. Well, great airplane. I mean, you look at um, Southwest. If you look, you can actually see all this online. You know, the reason now recently they did have challenges, but for 51 years, I mean, their protocols for uh, what they do on the ground uh, unmatched. I mean, as far as, you know, because they know that the time spent on the maintenance side of it. And, you know, you, Kevin, you're an athlete, too. You also know this. You run a marathon, triathlon, Ironman. And, you know, the most important part of any training is the recovery process. I mean, you got to be able to do well while you're not performing. And even athletes know this. Musicians, I mean, some of the best, you know, I was, I'm, I'm a big, because of the sleep thing, you look at the best athletes in the world. Some of them now get unbelievable levels of sleep. You know, there's, you oh, know, yeah. there's, you know. There's arguments that LeBron gets as much as 10 or 12 hours of sleep when he plays. Um, Tom Brady, nine hours of sleep. Federer, when he was at his prime, did nine to 10 hours of sleep. Even the greatest violinists in the in the world uh, sleep on average two hours more per day than the average human being does in the, in the world. So you can get a good sense of what downtime means for the uptime because – Work, 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 you know, to crank it out is just a bad philosophy. And even I heard this morning, I heard it in news and passing just while the TV was on downstairs that there's an argument in the world that the four hour work week is actually more productive than the five hour work week. Now, we've known this in dentistry forever. Yeah. I asked dentists, raise your hand if you've ever gone from five hour, five days yeah. or uh, five days to four days. And yeah. that, dentists go like this. And they, and then I go, keep your hands up if you lost money. And they're all like, no, yeah. I made more money when I, dropped a day so oh, i think the whole, yeah. the, the whole concept is is that in, in no different than family and you got to land the airplane to work on it so that it flies better when it you know now i have this question i always want to ask you because you're out there see 
Tell me what you think the future is going to look like when you look at the future of healthcare. Now we can only guess, but I love I love learning. You know, what's the future of healthcare dentistry and modern practice look like for the next couple of years, based on what you're seeing? Yeah, well, God, that's a great question. Healthcare in general, um, in in dentistry, incorporated into that is sort of again the pendulum swung and then it swung back and now it's going to move back. It really is coordinated care and um, and. For better or worse, um, airway has really helped bring that into us. Um, it it's it's it has helped us be more core. We already talk about interdisciplinary care. You know, inter, you know, make involving your orthodontist and your periodontist and you know your endodontist, all your specialists, your surgeons. You want to bring them in, but truly coordinated care to help people move towards health. It, it is the future. I mean, we're working because of airway. We are really, I mean, you know this really well, we are so starting to mingle traditional healthcare into the dental world to help patients move towards health. So again, I mean, you know, it started years ago with Frank up in Seattle. I mean, it was all the time sitting down with his specialists and going over cases. When I was in Portland years and years ago, I mean, we, once a month, I would sit down with my periodontist and orthodontist, and no, my endodontist didn't come. I'm sorry for the endodontist, but it really was just my orthodontist and periodontist at that time. But we would sit down once a month and and go over. Okay, we take you know go to dinner and everything, and talk about cases. Now, now those dinners are the psychologist, the the um, EMT. You know, you got EMT. I mean, in a couple of weeks, I'm having I'm having some. Uh, some airway surgery and, uh, um, you know, and it's courted. My, my primary health care provider knows. I mean, it's coordinated care, true coordinated care is the future. But, man, it, it's, it's not coming easy, is it? It's oh. taking work. Oh, well, it's a tremendous opportunity in the future, dentistry. And, Kevin, I'm so grateful. Now, I know people that are watching this, they're going to want to find out more about you. You speak to study clubs. You do a lot of online presentations. You're doing a lot of the bigger meetings now. If I, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, find out, keep in mind people are listening to this on iTunes. How can I find more about Dr. Kevin Cretion? You can just – my cell number – no, I'm kidding. My uh, – Actually, I have a website that's just ksquaredfacilitation.com, ksquared, Kevin Quishan, um, but ksquaredfacilitation.com, and it's got my contact info and some of the more popular presentations, sort of uh, descriptions of them, and then sort of talks about some other things I do and some testimonials and stuff. It's a, it's a pretty basic web page right now, but, but that's how you can contact me. Yeah, sounds good, buddy. Well, I always appreciate all the time we have together. I've enjoyed getting to know you, watching you take off and be a, a great voice in dentistry. And uh, I'm grateful that you carve out some time today, just hang out with us and sh share your thoughts. So I am, I, no, I say this from my heart, Kirk. I am, I am equally as grateful. And, and it means a lot to me that you reached out to me and um, like more than you know. So thank you very much. It's my pleasure, brother. So stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. And um, thank you guys for watching today. I really appreciate you tuning in. If you enjoyed today, just do us a favor. Hit the share button. Share with your friends. Keep sending us suggestions like you already have this morning and uh, things that you'd love to see with Kevin here in the future. I'll get him back and we'll ask him the tough questions and make him sweat a little bit. <laughs> All that kind of stuff. Um, and until we see you next time, keep watching the best practices show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.